Welcome to the Great Coaches Podcast. To me, being perfect is not about that scoreboard out there. This is a chance of life. When you can understand the person, you can then work towards a common goal. We are all on the same team. Now you roll and do it to the best of your ability. Focus on the fundamentals. We've gone over time and time again. Your defense has got to be better. Leave no doubt tonight. Great moments are born from great opportunity. My name is Paul Barnett, and you are listening to The Great Coaches Podcast, where we interview great sporting coaches to try and find ideas to help all of us lead our teams better. Our great coach on this episode is Joanne P. McCauley, or as she is called by her athletes, Coach P. Joanne played Big Ten collegiate basketball at Northwestern University from 1984 to 1987. In 1990, she transitioned into coaching as an assistant at Auburn University. In 1993, she became head women's team coach at the University of Maine. During her tenure, the team made six straight NCAA tournament appearances and won nine conference championships. In 2001, she became head women's team coach at Michigan State University and led them to five straight NCAA tournament appearances. Then in 2007, she was appointed head women's coach at Duke University. Joanne became the first Division I head coach to win a conference title in four different conferences, and also the first Division I coach to be named Coach of the Year in four different conferences. When we open this podcast, we always say that we interview great sporting coaches to try and find ideas to help all of us lead our teams better. But Joanne is a coach who also helps you live your life better. She radiates positive energy, and in this conversation, she connects the leadership behaviors required to be a great coach and a force for good when you're away from the team. There are many parts of this conversation that resonated with me, but the highlights were, as a coach, if you're not evolving, then you're not getting better and then you're not doing the very thing you're asking your athletes to do. If you're a great team, you don't look at the scoreboard as it's irrelevant until the game is over. You focus on the technical skills and intensity that you put in and keep trying to improve it. Her thoughts on choice versus chance and the habits you need to develop to improve your decision making in life. And Joanne shares some great stories to illustrate this and the expectation that suffering is part of life and you should view it as a means through which you can grow and build resilience. It was a privilege to spend time with Joanne for this interview and I hope it connects with you in the same way it did with Jim and I. The Great Coaches Podcast. Joanne McCauley, otherwise known as Coach P, welcome to The Great Coaches Podcast. Thank you so much. It's great to be with you. We are very thankful for getting a little bit of your time today, but maybe just a really simple question to begin with. Can you tell us where you are in the world and what you've been up to so far? Well, I have been, um, you know, I'm in Durham, North Carolina, of course, a great place. And I have been doing a great deal of writing uh, for my second book. And that book is called Secret Warrior. And in stepping away from Duke and having 28 years of coaching, head coaching experience, uh, there are quite a bit of stories, you know, from Maine to Michigan State to Duke. And this is sort of an all-encompassing worldwide book relative to its interest value, dealing with mental health, uh, dealing with stories. And I think it's fairly unique, um, but we'll see. And it comes out February, February 16th. I am very much <laughs> looking forward to talking to you about mental health and the four uh, universities you've coached at and how that's helped evolve your philosophy in the way that you coach and deal with people. So we'll get into that today. Yeah, great. But can I ask, probably just step back a little bit firstly, because you've had some firsthand experience of some legendary coaches. Yes, I <laughs> I'm yes. not gonna I'm not gonna try to pronounce Coach K's last name. Um, Shudevsky. That's the one. <laughs> try, try, try to spell it and you're really going to be special. I know. And I have a lot of Polish friends as well. I should be, I should be much better at that. But I, <laughs> Coach K, there's Joe Siampi and there's also K Yao. And this is just a couple that I was able to read. Yeah, I mean, Joe, okay, it's Joe Champi, K Yao, um, Tom Izzo. And I've had a wonderful exposure to Nick Saban, uh, spending a day with him down in Tuscaloosa. So I do feel, 
you know, and uh, and working directly with Tara Vandeveer mm-hmm. out of Stanford when she was, we were doing USA basketball together. So I've had quite a wide ranging exposure. So the question is, what is it you think these great coaches do differently? Uh, <laughs> well, they all have different personalities. Uh, they're all very comfortable in their skin in terms of how they deliver information and how they communicate. Obviously, there's a high level of technical understanding of the game. Um, There's different ways to motivate. Some are more calm, uh, direct about things. Uh, Tom Izzo comes to mind as somebody who's very aggressive and holds his head uh, in dismay on the sideline. I worry about him because sometimes I think he's going to get an aneurysm. Like I just worry he goes so aggressively um, at his team and, and has that referent power. I think it's important to know that each coach um, has referent power relative to their delivery. And so some coaches can be, you know, Coach K can be really tough. He can be very cerebral. Um, I haven't seen Tara as tough. I mean, she gets mad, um, but she is very, she articulates well and is very much comes from uh, the mind a little bit. Uh, K Yao definitely coming from a calm space allowing her faith to really drive her in her delivery. Um, Joe Champy came from West Point like Coach K. He was the women's coach when Coach K was the head coach. And so Joe, I think, took a lot of lessons from Mike. Again, great knowledge of the game, but, you know, not afraid to let it rip uh, if needed at certain times, Um, but always respectful of players, you know, just great coaches allowed to be free, Uh, Their coaching records were so strong that, you know, they're in a place of probably, I won't call them untouchables, uh, but definitely in a space of being able to coach and um, really communicate their ideals and their philosophy. You've actually reached a stage in your career (laughs) where you're now developing other coaches that are well on their way to being classified, Mm -hmm. I think, as great. The two that come to mind are Katie Abraham Henderson, Abrahamson, Henderson, yep. and Felicia Leggett Jack. Yes. When you talk to people about becoming a coach, what's the top pieces of advice you give them? Well, it's changed a lot as a profession. As you know, there's much higher salaries and there's much more to draw people. Again, when you look at some of the pioneering coaches that we talked about, and myself included, we entered the sport making very little money. I mean, we entered the sport based on passion. Um, I know, for example, my first salary was very, I mean, $40,000 for a division one head coach, you know, making 24,000 as an assistant, the the numbers were way down and and people will say, well, that's back in the time, you know, back in those economic days, but we all started from a very low base and never entering the profession due to money, due to the fact that it's now uh, much more profitable to be a coach. And I think we have to be careful about that because, you know, your motivations, I have to, I have to be authentic. You know, you have to love to coach. I love to coach. I could go coach a team for no money right now and just have a great time putting a team together. So there has to be that initial love and passion And I I think that's critical. And then, of course, mentoring, having a coaching tree. I've got some wonderful former players that are now assistants. Kristen Haney at Michigan State, Lindsey Bowen. um, I could name more. uh, Courtney Davidson at Hartford. Um, So you really take great pride in building a coaching tree. And Katie and Felicia were with me at Michigan State. And that was when we, we recruited some amazing players Liz Schimmick and Victoria Lucas Perry, Rene Haynes, and they were the ones that drove us to the national championship in 2005. So even though they weren't there for that because they went on to become head coaches, we're all connected by experiences. And um, it's, it's a great life, and I've enjoyed it thoroughly, but I've been doing it since I was 26 years old. And so now at 55, I have a chance to, to sort of go into another career path which is coaching, but not coaching just one team, coaching people and coaching mental health and reducing stigmas and, and being out there as a consultant for people that struggle of all, you know, all people, student athletes or, or whoever. So I, I'm going into a broader world um, and it might not be such a limelight world, you know, in the spotlight or it's more behind the scenes, I, I think, um, 
I think it will be. You said you're writing a book, your new one that comes out in February next year, The Secret Warrior. Have you written the last page yet? Um, yes, I've. it's gone to the editor. Yeah, it's being kind of attacked by the, you know, how they get after it. Um, now, my first book was Choice Not Chance, you know, Rules for a Fierce Competitor. So that's on Amazon. We did not publish that. I mean, we did not promote that terrifically well because it was sort of self-published with a little bit of help. And what I learned in this business is that you have to be with a publisher and actually get paid in advance to consider yourself an author. And so I'm actually an author on this. Um, So I'm actually an author on this second book. And the last was right now, the last chapter kind of just summarizes a lot of things, but it talks about stepping away from Duke and that decision to do so and what that was all about. I don't know if that stepping away chapter is going to stay in the last chapter um, because they may move it all around. But right now that's where it's at. And of course I'm working on endorsements and getting people to come on board. And that's been a lot of fun. Again, going back to people like Coach K and others, it's been great to reach out and receive some good support. Well, you also have a long relationship with the people at Nike as well. Oh, gosh, yes. I I adore the people at Nike. I adore them. 27 of my 28 years has been with them directly. I've enjoyed doing clinics. Lots of clinics. I've done clinics for um, female coaches. I've done clinics for male coaches. um, And of course, and mixed a lot, male and female. And I've also had the great pleasure. um, One lecture sticks out in my head where I was, first it was Roy Williams. And then it was me in the middle, sandwiched in the middle. And then it was Jim Beheim. And that was just great to be with them. And great to be coaching these men in explaining defensive philosophies and multiple defensive strategies. And so I I have some great memories of being flexible enough to, you know, be with some of the big guys, you know. (laughs) And have them. Yeah. And Jim Beheim was funny because he was like, okay, you just learned the matchup defense and all its complications from Coach P. Now I'm going to get in here and talk about a two, three. And it's nothing like the matchup, but it's a lot easier. So if you want to do that, pay attention to me. It was really, it was really funny. <laughs> You've really built your career over a long period. Each step has been higher and deeper and bigger and stronger. And it, and it results in you being the first division one coach to win in four different conferences. Yeah, that was, yeah. But what, what I found interesting is when you were talking about it, you said the success didn't come from applying the same principles each time you moved. So I was really, really curious to ask you from that first win until the fourth, how did your coaching philosophy evolve? Well, I mean, you just, if you're not evolving, then you're not getting better. And then you're not doing the very thing you ask your student athletes to do. So you've got to be consistent. One thing about coaching, it's very authentic and kids have a way of seeing through Uh, when things are not authentic or driven by a different motivation. So I guess, I mean, when you look, uh, my philosophies grew a great deal at Michigan State, meaning understanding the the psychology behind the process of coaching. When I was at Maine, I was definitely outcome driven and trying to prove myself as a young coach. We went to six straight NCAA tournaments with the highest point of beating Stanford in the NCAA tournament. Um, Maine is a mid-major, smaller school. And, I, you know, from there, it was pure British Italian driving the train. You know, I was a really tough coach at that time. I mean, just really tough. And the women at the time were so driven as well. And so I didn't have any problem with being a very tough coach. Uh, there's some great stories about those women yeah, in the book. But then I arrived at Michigan State, uh, very fortunate to be recruited you know, they actually came and watched me coach, which was really fun to think about it. So they came to watch me coach and, and I told them I couldn't possibly deal with them unless I was on my day off because they started to creep into my life when, you know, a late season NCAA tournament and things with Maine and, you know, you've got to stay true to your team. So they were kind of aggressive. And I said, look, I just, I can't talk with you. And then they said, well, you do have a day off. 
And I said, yes, I do once every, you know, once a week. And so once a week, they called me religiously. And I talked to the governor at the time, Governor Engler, um, Tom Izzo called, various people would call in, in these you know, phone calls. So mm-hmm. anyway, getting to Michigan State, I was introduced to it, Tom Izzo, of course, in watching his practices. And that just gave me a whole flavor of new uh, drills, a uh, way to develop my drills, my offense, defense further. You know, you just have to learn from a Tom Izzo. And, um, and so I did. And then I also had a sports psychiatrist uh, which I consider best in the world. I know that sounds funny, um, but he works with all the football teams, uh, Alabama, uh, Texas A&M, LSU. He consulted with the Philadelphia Eagles. And Dr. Rosen was a person who taught me a lot about words and reframing the way te- individuals and players think cognitively. You know, there are words you can use, for example, when you're talking to a player and they're perhaps not feeling as good as they should about their talents, you know, you can say you're very good or you're a great player, but it's, it's much better to talk to a player about how dangerous they are, you know, dangerous with their skill set. You know, you, you're dangerous by being on the floor and always being an issue for the opponent. You know, there's other philosophies like a Christmas tree, you know, you know, the blinking lights on a Christmas tree. And there's always one that's very bothersome that always seems to blink no matter what. Well, you don't want to be that blinking light of your team. You know, you don't want to be the one that causes all the attention or constantly is giving effort or not giving effort and sort of blinking with your commitment. And so you get these sort of storytelling words. Um, I can go on and on about these things. Like, you know, the score, you know, no scoreboard mentality. Okay. That's the idea that if you're a great team, you don't ever look at the scoreboard. You know, you could be up 20 points. Okay. That's great, but it's irrelevant unless the game is over. And so however you got to 20 points up, you know, must be continued and you must change accordingly to keep the intensity and the technical skills moving forward. And so you talk to your team about a no scoreboard mentality and and a complete focus on our team. Um, You get ready for opponents through scouting reports and all that, but, but it's really important to understand these principles and what they do is they lock in around your team and it leads to a philosophy that, it's well, it's communicative, you know, it, it, you communicate in a certain way and there's a certain clarity. Now, great sports psychiatrists will meet with people one on one as well. Uh, they don't generally meet with the team. It's sort of like that sort of um, intruding in a way mentally that most times you don't want to. You want individuals to sit down. Um, and there are things that I as a coach can learn nothing confidential, but what I can learn is if I have a player and that player's name is Sarah and Sarah talks to a sports psychiatrist about how she motivates and what her issues are because you're a sports psychiatrist, you're a doctor. So that that's all confidential HIPAA information um, as we call it in the States. And so, but I can be told takes, you know, with Sarah, catch her doing things right. And when you catch her doing things right, you know, obviously be very verbal about that. When you're correcting her, be very uh, sort of secondary and off the court when you do it. And you might say, well, lots of, lots of players like that, you know, they want to do that, but it's not really true. If you have an alpha dog, an alpha, a leader, vocal, aggressive, alphas like to kind of take it and, and alphas often like to take it in front of the team because they prefer to be a leader and held accountable so that it can be seen of their toughness and their response. And so identifying alpha dogs, identifying characters and personalities is all part of it. So I got exposed to some really high level uh, thinking. And um, there's no doubt it was part of our national championship run. 
And it's no doubt that it became part of my coaching philosophy all the way through Michigan State, all the way through Duke. And again, it's not every player. You know, it's some players need more than others. Um, and they, the kids know that I know this, you know, Dr. Rosen, that they know I talk to him. But he also tells me when I'm off base, you know, where I'm thinking just, you know, the wrong thought about something, uh, maybe an opponent, um, you know, the, the, the trap games that can occur, you know, a game you're supposed to win is a dangerous game because it's dangerous because it could be taken for granted. And so, you know, coming off a great victory, oh, a super win, and then having a game 48 hours following, you know, you definitely can have a dip unless you're talking about putting together maybe 80 minutes or, four, you know, of two, 80 minutes of a weekend or 40 minutes of a game and trying to go two for two, you know, with a focus on each philosophy that applies to each team, each kind of strategy. Anyway, um, I feel really fortunate because I was the only female with this uh, mentor, Dr. Rosen, to win a national title with him. Sorry, play for, wish I, we won. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, was a, that was a slip yeah. um, uh, to play for a national title. And otherwise, I worked with the guys, so to speak. You know, Jimbo Fisher at Texas A&M, you know, Nick Saban. Of course, he, he consults for all student athletes at Michigan State. Um, so this kind of presents a story. And then, of course, when I got to Duke, the cerebral nature of Coach K creeps in um, relative to, you know, the next play, you know, um, the fist, you know, and how we, you know, the elements that all he's promoted in his, in his books. And when I was a younger coach at Maine, backing up, I read all of Coach K's books at that time. And it was one of the reasons I got the job at Duke, because when I met with Coach K, you know, I was talking about his philosophy, what I had learned in his books. So I've had some interesting mentors and interesting ways to think about the game. And now I hope to kind of coach people across the board using, well, using sport. Well, it's definitely, a, uh, can definitely hear elements of everything you're saying that are applicable to people everywhere in corporate life, in personal life, leading community teams, et cetera. But when I was researching you and preparing for today, I really enjoyed reading about choice, not chance as a philosophy, mm -hmm. but there was a part of it that really resonated with me personally. And that was the whole idea of going against the grain. And I'm wondering yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that and how it applies to you as a coach and how you've used it with your, with your athletes. Well, you know, again, it, you know, choice, not chance determines your destiny, choose to become a champion in life. That's the whole quote. And I've used that since main days. And that came from reading and putting things together. And I think it's very important that your choices are, it's the little choices that lead to the big ones. And it's the little choices that are actually more important on how you carry yourself. So we talked a lot about that. I also used it in camp with young people, you know, and I joke with the young people, you know, did you make your bed today? And how do you feel when you make your bed or how do you feel when your room is completely clean and you're organized, you know, how, you know, how does that, it goes back to the clean closet, you know, after you've, you know, kind of cleaned out a closet, sort of the euphoria you feel with sort of getting, Organized. So making choices comes as small as making your bed daily to the biggest, you know, big choices of where to go to college and whatnot. Again, in my coaching, I look for players that make the right choices and I do favor the people that work the hardest. You know, they always talk about, oh, I don't favor anybody. You know, the truth of the matter is you love each member of your team the same. You know, if you're on a boat and the ship is going down, and you're trying to save people. I mean, obviously you would save anyone you could see under any circumstances. So you love them all, but you have to be clear that I witness their choices. I see whether they stay in the gym longer. I see their grades, you know, choices that they make in studying in classroom. And that I try to put this all together in evaluating their choices. Um, if they go out and they, you know, they party or they take, 
you know, they just do things that are not conducive to the team. There's another quote that I love, which is what you do, you do to the team. And so what your choices are, you know, you affect the team. You're not in a vacuum by yourself. And the other piece is too, in, in the world where we can all be victims, when you go to choice and not chance, chance indicates that I really can't control things. I was born into this situation or, you know, I don't have the love for my parents or, you know, I can be a victim of situation. And that is a terrible thing to think about if you're a young person that you're kind of trapped. Choice indicates that you're not and that you can make even the smallest choices uh, that would make a difference in your life. So it's an empowerment philosophy and it can be used simply, you know, with the campers um, or it can be used more at a higher level with student athletes or again with corporations and teaching and whatnot. And so I enjoyed that first book. I, I wrote that and had a little bit of help with Rob Rains at that time. Um, again, Secret Warrior is different. I wrote the whole thing. But it's not, you know, that's all my writing plus the editor. I mean, you, you've got to have editors. And, you know, but it was much more um, really coming from me directly. Your high school coach. Yes. Fred Kerber. He was the first person to suggest to you, you should think about coaching one day. What do you think he saw in you? Gosh, your background on my, wow, you're, you're studying to get ready for this interview is absolutely fascinating. It might be the best I've ever experienced. Um, so I have to say that. Um, yeah, Fred Kerber, a fabulous coach and person, a mentor to me today. He did, he called me Jojo. You know, one of my nicknames quietly is Jojo. And so he would say, Jojo, I think you'd be a fascinating coach or very good coach or, you know, and I just looked at him like, you've got to be kidding. I'm a player, you know, and I could only see myself in the player perspective. And it's interesting that he was correct. I kind of got into coaching by accident. It wasn't something I pursued. I went through political science. Well, first I went through radio, TV, film at Northwestern. And then I went through political science going to be this, I don't know, this great lawyer, attorney, barrister, I guess, as some people say, right over, over the pond. But I, you know, worked in a law firm and that didn't work out. So anyway, long story short, I am a coach by accident because then I got my MBA and I was going to go into the corporate world because I had worked in the corporate world for one year after Northwestern. So all these crazy details, you know, put me in a place where originally I was looking for a graduate assistantship where my MBA would be paid for. So I'm, I'm a product of incredible gender equity and support in our country. So I had four years of Northwestern in a scholarship. And then I had two years at Auburn working with Joe Champion. My first two, I was a graduate assistant. So to think that basketball could lead me to six years, I mean, that's an enormous amount of money. Um, and providing you with that opportunity, obviously you never leave the ball. You know, I mean, you never leave the concept of the basketball. And oftentimes you'll get a team together and some, you'll have them hold the ball and tell how they got there and what it means to them and then pass the ball to their teammate who then holds it because that's a commonality we have. And in our society today, it's all about how we're different. And, and coaches can't stand that. I mean, you can't have an effective team when you're pointing out everybody's differences. You know, you can, you got to celebrate them and then you got to, what's the common bond? And then we pass that ball around and we see it's all about that. So we look for similarities. We look for coaches are coaches are generally apolitical. You know, I don't talk politics because that's, ooh, that gets kind of yucky. But I will say we're apolitical and we're very usually pretty independent, you know, thinking um, because we're independent thinkers with our teams as well. Your father, if I've done my research correctly, your father <laughs> was a Navy pilot and you, yeah. moved, you moved around a bit as a child. And I imagine this must have helped build resilience. And, you know, we started this interview with you talking about your passion for helping in mental health. And I want to ask you about the other charities you're involved with in a minute, but I'd like to just drill in and talk about resilience because 
I think it is the most important skill right now to teach to teach young people and older people and perhaps everybody. But you strike me as someone who is very good at teaching resilience. And I'm just wondering if you could talk to us about how you've helped athletes develop a sense of resilience, of coming back again, of keep showing up and moving forward. You know, first of all, there's a, there's a presumption here uh, that life is some of this joyous thing and all the pictures that people put on Facebook, like everybody's happy all the time. The reality is the principle is that suffering, suffering is part of the deal. And by suffering, you are able to get to the core of what, what the difficulties are. And, and you feel like feeling pain is a part of life. It is not something you can remove. Life is full of ups and downs, good times. I mean, sometimes it's good times and then immediately following it's bad. I mean, it's just things you, you can't believe you're up, you're down, you're, you're thinking about life, but if you have a measure of faith in the process, if you're a person of faith in general, if you're a person that's spiritual or thinks about things and knows that if you do your very best, good things will happen, but you will suffer. Things will go wrong. You will get injured. Perhaps you will get into situations where you have a hard time communicating you will lose games. You will win games. You will be on the bench. You will be a starter. You know, you, there's so many roles that you can play. And so I like books that talk about getting comfortable with suffering. And I've had enormous amount of suffering that I think has developed me in a very strong way. And character comes from that. So we do talk a lot about embracing suffering and you know we kind of you know kind of joke about it sometimes like okay ladies we are gonna suffer you know through this conditioning and you can look at it two ways you can let that suffering take you down and and feel you know feel weaker because of that or you can rise and you can get past any suffering despite how you feel when you run around the track or something i mean you can make it so it's light but palpable or, you know, definitely motivational. And so we're comfortable with suffering. I mean, I told our team, for example, this year we had a a weird schedule and we had some difficult games, probably in wrong places relative to our situation. And then we had people hurt at that time. So we got into a situation where we lost games and we generally don't lose a lot of games at Duke. And we lost more than normal in a period of time in December. Well, I told them, I said, you know, I hate to break it to you, but I'm not crying. You know, I'm not crying about this. This is not something to cry about. This is a suffering that's going to lead us to incredible things. And of course, at that moment, they probably thought, I don't think so. But I also told them relevancy is earned. You know, you don't become relevant because you sign on to some great corporation or you wear Duke on the front of your shirt. You become relevant by action and by each team. And so somehow in there, the team figured out that we had to make ourselves relevant. And it was coming from great suffering. I mean, people questioning us. And of course, the coaches always get attacked. You know, you got to win basically every game or else. Right. I mean, that's part of something we sign on to. Well, we, we had the greatest comeback in ACC history by being down at 10th place for a moment, which was, well, very uncomfortable and definitely suffering to go all the way to finish third in the league behind two wonder, you know, to Louisville and NC state who was having a marvelous year and won the conference tournament. So, you know, again, loving that process. Now I have to tell you some Duke fans just, because we didn't win 28 games, I mean, don't even, wouldn't even recognize that. And that's a small percentage. And those are the people that want to really get at you regardless. But, you know, a lot of Duke fans understood the process and were like, wow. I mean, they really turned it around. And it was sad that the NCAA tournament was canceled for everybody. And for us, we were the hottest team in the country at the time. And so kind of 
Well, it, you know, it's the never know. And there are many, many people, obviously, besides us that never will know what would have happened with that the season last year. Whilst that's the one that got away, there are plenty of other victories that I'm sure you should be very proud about. But if I can talk about service for a minute, because it's a, it's actually a big theme in, in your life. Mm-hmm. You are a passionate supporter of community service. Big Brothers, Big Sisters, which I think is a great organisation. Um, you're involved with others that service homeless families, Alzheimer's, and of course, given your experience with cancer, you're, you're also supporting mm-hmm. cancer sufferers as well. So it's a big theme in your life. And I'm wondering if you could just share a story of how you've um, been helped as a coach by others. Oh, God. When it's been returned to you as a father, uh, when times have been difficult. Well, I think, um, you know, giving, giving away or giving time is an incredibly important thing. Uh, recruiting one special student athlete was very interesting, and that's Faith Suggs. Faith, as I recruited her, I learned the story of her mother passing from melanoma when Faith was just 12 years old, 13 years old in that range of being a young person growing up. And that put enormous perspective in my dealings with melanoma. Obviously we had a common issue, but I was one of the people that, you know, I was able to be detected early. You know, I was an early detection person and grateful for that. And then I couldn't believe how things might've been different for Susan, Faye's mother, in terms of if she had been exposed to what I had been exposed to. One of the reasons um, I respect Duke so much is the medical, the Duke hospital and the medical care and the urgency and immediacy they bring to situations. Um, So my malignant melanoma, I've only had one in the rest of my you know, cuts or surgeries, whatever you want to call them, have been proactive and getting after early mel- uh, malignant cells. So when you speak about getting back, that whole story, you know, we ran a story on faith. There's some beautiful video in her story. Uh, her father played in the NFL, Schaefer Suggs. Um, she has a wonderful brother, Devin. So she was sort of challenged with raising her brother, and her father and kind of being obviously that female uh, person in their life. And so learning her story and then having her able to tell her story when she got older at Duke, she got to the point where she wanted to talk about it, tell it, share it and allow people to learn from it. Well, that connection that we shared, obviously that's, you know, that's what it's all about and sharing suffering. I mean, there's nothing I can say about melanoma that isn't suffering. I mean, the way you, I, I got cut up twice, surgery twice in my forehead. I mean, I looked like Frankenstein. And I can remember Coach K looking at me when I came to the office and came to work saying, wow, what happened to the other guy? You know, <laughs> you know, using sense of humor in a various <laughs> difficult situation. So there's just a lot of ways that if you communicate, it comes full circle. And so what I received back from faith is something I can't, I mean, she works with me now. Interesting. She's one of the warriors in the book and I don't mind sharing a little bit of that. And faith is a person that's working with me now to promote the book. And we want this book to go worldwide. You know, I I want COVID's going to go away. We're going to solve that. And I want to fly over there, meet you all in person, talk to a huge group, take questions. It would be, you know, all the places I've been in in Europe and, and spending a lot of time in in England, the worldwide approach is the way to go. And that's why this podcast is so incredible. That's why it's, it might be, you know, looking at coaches or very talented coaches, but this is a talented podcast. Well, (laughs) I appreciate you saying that, but I think the reality is that we all need more coaches in our life because when I speak to people like yourself, what comes through is a sense of selflessness and also a sense of stoicism, whether you call it resilience or whatever it is, like just being able to keep going when things get tough. And and I think we need a little bit more of that these days. I think there's a, there's a place for that. And we always, as we were talking about before we started, there's always 
airtime for the star performer, the TikTok dancer, the person <laughs> who is that. But there's not always the space for the people behind the scenes that are coalescing the group and bringing them together. So I appreciate you saying that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but you also talked about mental health at the start, and it's a big issue. I think it's I think it's always been a big issue, but it's bec- we're talking about it a lot more. Um, we're definitely becoming more aware about it in all elements of society. You've been quite open about your um, experiences with it and also wanting to help others deal with it. In fact, you know, you talked about helping coaches and get better at recommending the signals with, within their student athletes. I'd be really interested to hear from you around what are some of the simple things you know, we should be looking for when we're, when we're coaching teams, what should we, what are these red signals that, that we should be keeping our eye on? Um, I think that comfortability is important and it's not so much hmm, talking about it. It, It's a very individual thing. I mean, it's not something I, I talk to the team about their physical and mental health, their mind body and how they have one body and one mind. And that's all they have. Can't trade it in. Um, so I'm, I'm clear about the care of mind and body. The next step is the one-on-one conversations and just getting to know the student athletes off the court and allowing them a safe space to share information if they want to. Okay. So you're not trying to dig that, that would make people uncomfortable. Um, you're trying to share, you know, boy, I went through, um, a tough time when I didn't believe in myself as a player back at Northwestern, I struggled when I was a freshman or sophomore. Um, so it's sharing your experiences and then allowing them a safe space. And then sometimes I've been directly involved with, I've witnessed a player just be just so damaging to herself that I had to ask the question and say, we need to look at this person, you know, Whole, a holistic way. And I believe they need some care, psychiatric or psychologist. And, and some, some schools in our country are really ahead of the game. You know, they may have a sports psychiatrist right in their athletic department or psychologist. And there is a difference, big difference between the two as the sports psychiatrist can bring medicine into the equation if that's necessary. So I've had student athletes go through a process and find that they did have anxiety issues. Um, Medicine was prescribed and then they didn't want to take their medicine because they're student athlete and they don't want to bring foreign substances into their body, nor do they want to be considered weak, you know, for, for, and that's a real, that's a real issue if people are actually diagnosed. Now, sometimes it's just cognitive restructuring of how people are viewing the world. You know, they're coming from a negative space and it's able to turn it and say, well, you really could look at it this way and kind of trying to change their thinking. Um, Now the great psychiatrists, psychologists do that, study it, you know, become the experts. Well, I am not one of those things. I'm a coach. And so I've just really paid attention to the mental, excuse me, the mental elements and how that's part of the whole picture. And to be honest with you, pro tennis players, Olympians, they have a trainer, they have a sports psychiatrist, they have a coach, you know, they have everything surrounding them so they can be successful. And you'd like that for every student athlete. You'd like that for everybody in the world. I mean, you'd like people to be able to have that kind of support and It would come in a variety of ways. For me, I'm a consultant. Okay, I'm the person you can call up and discuss the coaching element of trouble that 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 someone is having. I if I found somebody that seemed they could harm themselves or off in a way that I it wasn't for me, I would pass that person to a doctor. But that person might never get to a doctor unless they have a liaison, something in between that says, well, yeah, it's okay. It's what people do. And when you get through this difficult time, you will be better than you've ever been in your life. And I have found that to be true. I have seen that with my own eyes. And so mental health is part of it. 
And that's why we started the mental wealth game at Duke. And, you know, I've taken it from there and had speakers, Shamika Holtzclaw, openly diagnosed with schizophrenia, Tennessee All-American, national champion. Uh, her speaking was incredible, the way she, you know, talked about things. So the more stories about success, there's a lot of books written on how mental health is just really, I mean, pulled people down in a way that was not recoverable. And there needs to be lots of writing about the positive stories and the fight back spirit, because you have to fight back and you have to fight for a healthy mind. So talking about fighting back, I want to jump into women, female coaches in athletics. This is another thing you've spoken about. It's a very important area. I the, the statistic that I often talk about and gets played back to me as well is that go back to the Rio Olympics. It was in 2016. Only 11% of the accredited coaches were female. So we've got to get more women into coaching. My open-ended question to you is how can we do that? Well, we have to continue with education, continue with opportunity. As you know, there's very few female athletic directors in our country. Um, the pioneering spirit, whether it starts from Billie Jean King, you know, Donna Lopiano, there's been women that have been extraordinary. Um, Donna Lopiano developed the Women's Sports Foundation, you know, highlighting women in sport. I think that one thing we could do better is highlight more women in sport that aren't exactly all Americans or Olympians, you know, just across the board, people, people that might be the fabulous administrators, you know, sometimes a great player does not make a great coach. You know, so, you know, if you look at uh, a medium player, giving them seminars, you know, there are seminars with the women's basketball coaches association that are, so you want to be a coach, right? So you want to be a coach and they bring women and there's a lot of discussion on how to be a coach. There needs to be a lot more than that. I mean, it's just, that's just a little bit. And there's very few of anything that says, you know, how do you become an administrator? Think about it. If the women are athletic directors, you know, they are going to be more comfortable looking at the diversity of the pool. And us women think that we're kind of it, you know, in terms of intuitive and, <laughs> you know, it's like uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? She said, if there's any decision making, a woman or more have to be in the room. And so breaking down that whole structure that it's just basically built by the fact that guys, you know, were playing sports more earlier and, you know, it's been a process and the equity pieces are critical and keeping women in the game. I mean, when they're 14 and 15, a lot of women are dropping out. And they're dropping out a lot of women because they say, well, I can't really be the best. I can't really be an All-American. Maybe I'm not being recruited by the school that I really want. Instead of thinking, well, wait a minute, I can change the whole dynamic here. I can be the senior women's administrator at Duke. I can work my way up the line. I can become an athletic director. I can you know, change, change so many things that way. So there's, there's got to be more diversity in what we teach. And the old girl network has to arrive in strength. And also, too, we must have fun with the old boy network. Like, you can't look at that as, oh, I just, you know, it, it can't be an opponent. Um, I play golf. <clears throat> One of the reasons I play golf is because I saw all these guys playing golf. And I thought, well, I got to get in on those conversations that take place on the golf course. And a lot of conversations take place on the golf course. So you have to put yourself in these positions where you have exposure. And one of my biggest donors and supporters at Maine, uh, that, that business dealing occurred on the golf course. And we were playing, me and, um, we, me and Walter were playing two other people. So we were bonding as teammates on the golf course. And you make that beautiful birdie putt you know, and celebrate that. And something really breaks down, you know, about, I don't know, differences and then excitement about women's basketball. Next thing I know, his oil company is sponsoring a tournament. Dead River Oil was putting money towards my program at Maine. 
And so you look at Condoleezza Rice and she's what the only female board member, I think at the masters, if I said that correctly, well, my goodness, finally, and all of that will start to, you know, work. But remember Condoleezza loves football. She she loves college football. I mean, she's also a concert pianist and an incredible person, but again, she, I could just see her, you know, talking about all this, these kind of topic matters that you can talk about gender to gender and not just football, but anything, you know, it's just working your way. And I felt that I've tried to do that through my career is try to get involved with things. And so I play golf now. There's a quote from you that I'd like to play back to you. I don't know whether it's going to be in the front page of your new book, but it probably should be. It says, people ask me what coaching is. And I think it's the business of developing people and empowering others. And I choose to do this through basketball. So I'd like to ask you, I don't know whether you're finished as a coach. You may come back and do it again. So let's use the the future tense. When you do finish coaching, what's the legacy you want to have left behind? The legacy is just impact, um, being able to mentor, change lives. You know, being able to change lives. Uh, uh, Women I've spoken to, um, a variety of issues. Um, I know some women have spoken to me about orientation and their own orientation because they're in college. And college is when you discover yourself and make a lot of choices and then having parental problems with acceptance. And so I think about those women um, talking with them and, and, and encouraging them to move forward, but also to be graceful in understanding other people's issues and not to let that reflect on them. And um, I had a current conversation of a former player lately about that very issue and being able to understand the healing of time for people and, you know, the, the limits that some people have in understanding. And so I get back to your question. We are in, it's not a business. It really bothers me. I, I mean, I know there's lots of money involved, but if you get to the core of it, it, it it's the business of developing people and trying to move their minds, you know, move their minds so that when they graduate, they're at a bigger space and, and, and can think better. You know, I, you, I think you should always think deeply and feel deeply. And I don't think you can do that unless you suffer. <laughs> and also, unless there's a mentor or a person that drives you to do that. Joanne McCauley, it's been an absolute pleasure talking today and hearing a little bit more about your story. I look forward to the new book, but I look forward even more to seeing you in Prague one day and organizing that room full of people for you. Oh, I would love that. Prague is such a special place. Only been there one time, uh, but would love to come back and uh, meet you personally and and just talk with people. I think we're I think we're worldwide at this point. I think this virus has made it very clear that we're all humans and we're all susceptible. And so we might as well stay worldwide completely after this uh, challenge that we're going through. Thank you for your time today, Joanne. Okay, thank you. Take care. The Great Coaches Podcast. Hi, everyone. It's Jim here. You've been listening to our discussion with Coach P, Joanne P. McCauley. The key highlights for me were her thoughts on expectations and how they can be harnessed and used to help the team develop and individuals build resilience, coaching to move people's minds so that they're in a bigger space and can think and feel more deeply, and coaching female athletes who feel that they can't be good enough to make it to the starting team and may want to drop out to look beyond careers as athletes and develop in other areas related to the game. I hope you enjoyed it as much as Paul and I did. Coming up next on The Great Coaches Podcast, we speak to author and golf coach, Steve Band. So the great golf coaches or the great coaches of any sport have the ability to identify what their athlete needs right at that time so they can play at their play at their best. So when you're coaching at a major, of course, you're not working on the golf swing. You Most times you're working on shots and strategy and the other skills so they can play their best that week. And just before we go, Coaches are not usually the type of people who seek the spotlight. And so if you can put us in contact with a great coach that you know has a unique story to share, then we would love to hear from you. You can contact us using the details in the show notes. Mm -hmm.